Hi guys, welcome to The Attic. My name's Mark Jago. I'm a philosophy professor in the UK. In this video, I want to talk you through some of the things that I think are the most important factors in doing your PhD. And I hope in going through this with you, it might help you if you're thinking about choosing where to do your PhD. Okay, so if that sounds as exciting to you as it does to me, why don't you give this channel a thumbs up? That really helps me out with it getting found on YouTube. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon for notifications. Okay, so I'm going to be talking through the factors that really influence your PhD, the quality of the work that you come out with, the quality of your thesis. I'm not going to be talking about a bunch of factors like, you know, where you live, where your mind is, how you're getting on with life in general. Obviously, they have a massive impact on your work, but, you know, I can't really help you out with that sort of stuff. So I'm not going to be talking about them. I'm going to be talking about the academic stuff. Number one, your supervisor. I think this is the most important factor in determining how your PhD goes. The relationship you have with your supervisor is absolutely crucial. If you have a good relationship, that's just going to make life so much easier. If that relationship doesn't go well, if it goes bad at some point, it just makes the whole thing really, really difficult. And, you know, when I talk to people about their their PhDs, people who have had a really good time during their PhD and come out with a really good thesis, they tend to say, yeah, my supervisor was great. We had a really good relationship. Flip side of that. When I talk to people who are maybe struggling with their PhD or maybe they're thinking about dropping out or it's not going great. Nearly always one of the problems in there is the relationship they're having with their supervisor. Okay, so a PhD supervisor does a whole bunch of different things for you. They're not really like a boss. They're more like an advisor. So they're going to be reading your work, commenting on it, giving you suggestions for where it should go, for what you should think about, telling you what's good, telling you what's not so good, helping you with your writing, your structure. So doing all that kind of day to day nitty gritty stuff. They're also going to be giving you, you know, academic expertise. So if you're doing a philosophy PhD, for instance, they're going to be telling you about the kind of philosophy you need to think about. So having somebody who is an expert in that area is really, really important, right? So I've supervised lots of different undergrad projects. I can supervise on a wide range of areas there. But when it comes to PhD, really, I would want to supervise on stuff that is stuff that I'm actually writing on, stuff that I'm a real expert in so that I can guide my students kind of in the right direction. So I'm not just kind of saying, oh, yeah, that's a good argument. Yeah, you can say that. I'm thinking, hmm, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? This article has just come out like a couple of months ago. Maybe you should think about that sort of stuff. So having that kind of real expert advice is important. Supervisor is also important for you when you come to finish your PhD and you're looking for a job. Your supervisor is going to be writing you a reference. So in a way, the more well known and famous your supervisor is, that might help your reference hold a little bit more weight. OK, so if you get a reference written by somebody and the people who are reading it, they've never heard of this person. Well, they think, yeah, maybe they're saying this is a good candidate. If they're getting a reference written by, you know, a really famous philosopher and it says this person is amazing, they might be thinking, oh, yeah, maybe this person really is amazing. Maybe m maybe they get the job. The reason that this makes your decision in who's going to supervise you tricky is the ideal supervisor is somebody who is an expert in the field who is really well known and also has loads of time for you. And those three things kind of pull apart, right? Because the more famous they are, they're going to have loads of different projects on. And, the, you know, the more expert they are in the field, they're going to have lots of different projects on, lots of different students who want to study with them. That might mean they have less time for you day to day. OK, so in finding the perfect supervisor, it's not just about going to work with this really famous person. You want to talk with them before you commit to a PhD to kind of find out, are you going to get on with them? What is that relationship going to be like? How much time are they going to have for you? You want to ask those questions before you dive in. Number two, cohort. The people who are doing a PhD in the same subject at the same time as you. 
this is really, really important factor, and I think people undervalue it. A lot of people think, oh, a PhD, that's me working on my own, you know, with a supervisor, so what those other people are doing and whether there's any people there or not doesn't really matter. But it does matter. It makes a huge difference. So even though during your PhD you're not going to classes with all the other students, you're not kind of working with them in the same way, you still get a lot from that PhD cohort. And if they're really good at what they do, they kind of lift you up. They lift up the quality of your own work. And if it's not really happening in their world, that kind of, I feel it kind of drags you down a little bit. So let me give you an example. I did my PhD in two different departments. I did it at Nottingham University. I did it in the computer science department, but also jointly in the philosophy department. In the computer science department, there was a cohort of about eight of us. We all started at the same time. We worked in an office together. We were in there pretty much nine to five, Monday to Friday, kind of all working together. Even though they were all working on completely different things to me, I was doing kind of like logic and they were doing programmy type stuff. There was so much in that world that I didn't know about that they would tell me about. There's a big whiteboard and we would ask questions and they would do demonstrations. And that really helped me out to understand that world of things, you know, and that helped me out when I was thinking about formal stuff, proof theory, things like that. But I also got a sense from them of how are you structuring your time? How are you putting your PhD together? How do you go from the first year to the second year to the third year to getting this thing finished? All that kind of stuff, because they worked really hard and they had lots of experience. That really helped me to get through the tough times. Now, I'm going to contrast that with my experience in philosophy. And I don't think, you know, it was a bad experience in philosophy, but it was just different. The cohort in philosophy, there wasn't so many people. Very few of them, I think, were doing it as a kind of a career thing. Like during my three, four years of PhD, there was maybe only one or two other philosophy students who were kind of really dead set on a career in philosophy. So there we didn't have this kind of cohort effect, OK? There was no real sense of here's a person to go and talk to, to explain my ideas to, for them to explain their ideas to me and together we'll lift each other up. That didn't really happen on the philosophy side for me. And basically what that did to me over the three years is I was much more invested in the computer science side of my PhD than I was in the philosophy side. And, you know, that kind of had problems later on. Now, for most people, you're not going to be doing like this crazy kind of two side PhD in different subjects. You're just going to do it in one subject. But I think the experience shows that having a really good, committed cohort, even if they're working on really different topics to you, as long as they're in the same subject, you know, you're all studying philosophy or you're all studying history or whatever. I think that has a really, really big effect on the quality and the experience that you have when you're doing your PhD. Number three, faculty. OK, so the academics, the, the lecturers, the professors, in addition to your supervisor at the department you're going to work. I think this has a not a huge effect, but it definitely does have an effect on your overall academic study during the PhD. OK, why is that? Why isn't it just the, the, the supervisor that has an effect? Well, you're going to be working alongside this faculty, these professors, right? You're going to be seeing their talks. They're going to be seeing your talks and commenting on them. You're going to be reading their work, perhaps. You're going to go to department events with them. So the way they go about their academic work, that is going to kind of impact on your sense of what academic life is like. So if you go and study at a department that has loads and loads of really kind of research intensive projects going on with loads of things happening, loads of events, that is going to impact on the way that you understand your own academic work. OK, that's a, that's a positive thing. If you go to a department where maybe your supervisor is great, but the rest of the faculty, they're not really up to much. Maybe they're not that into the research or whatever. Then maybe you won't get so much of a sense of what academic life or academic work is all about. The other way in which the faculty comes into your own kind of PhD study might not be in your PhD itself. I mean, if that faculty are working on completely different topics, maybe their views won't actually get into your thesis, but it will get into your overall academic understanding of your subject, right? So I'm a philosopher. I did my PhD in logic. Nobody else in the philosophy department was doing logic, but there was lots of metaphysicians. There was lots of people doing ethics and, and understanding their work has kind of influenced the way I think about those topics now. So when I'm now working on metaphysics or if I have to do a bit of ethics teaching, I'm kind of drawing on the conversations I have with those other faculty members 
all the way back at my PhD. OK, had I gone to a different department, I would be thinking about those subjects in a different way. So the faculty is important not just for your PhD work, but also for your development as an academic in general. Number four, the university, the department, the school that you pick for your PhD. This is the one that people always talk about like it's the most important thing. I don't think it's the most important thing, but People go on about this all the time. Where did you do your PhD? Oh, wow, you did it at Oxford. That's fantastic. Where did you do your PhD? I did it at Nottingham. Hmm, where's that? That's what people always ask you. And I just don't think it's that important. It is important in the sense that you've got to pick the department that's going to have the right supervisor for you. It's important in the sense that if you go to a well thought of, well ranked department, you know, if you go to Oxford, you're going to have a really good cohort and you're going to have a really good other faculty there. If you go to a really tiny department, maybe there won't be much of a cohort. Maybe there won't be much of another faculty for you to pick ideas up from. But beyond the factors that I've already talked about, your supervisor, the cohort, the faculty, I don't think the school really matters all that much. There are a few aspects in which it is important. So one of them is funding, OK? As a PhD student, you might want to be going to conferences, summer schools, things like that. Do they have funding for PhD students to enable you to travel to those things? In other words, are they going to pay for you to go on those things or are you going to have to do it out of your own pocket? They might have a placement officer who gives you advice on applying for jobs at the end of it, you know, gives you a mock interview, that kind of thing. That's, you know, it's a it's a minor thing, but when it comes to it, it is important. OK, and there's also the kind of reputation that your department has. You know, is it Oxford? Woo. Is it Nottingham? Ooh, where's that? That shouldn't matter, but it does matter when you apply for jobs, when you go and do things. You know, if, if you come from a really highly thought of department, maybe that really does help you out in getting a job. So if you're if you're taking the career option seriously, you're doing a PhD to have an academic job. Yeah, you know, I really would recommend other things being equal, choosing the higher ranked place over the lower ranked place for the point of view of getting a job. Doesn't mean you're going to have a better experience there. You might even have a worse experience there. But other things being equal, the higher ranked department might well help you out, give you a bit of a leg up in getting a job later on. OK, so there are four factors that I think are important in influencing your PhD work. So I think you should think about those four things in choosing where you're going to do your PhD. Supervisor is the most important one. I really encourage you to talk to a potential supervisor before you jump in to kind of see if that's going to be right for you. The other factors, you know, cohort, when well, you don't know what that's going to be like in advance, if you choose a high ranked research intensive university, you're pretty sure it's going to have a good cohort. What you could do if you want to is go along to an event at that department. So most departments are going to have research seminars. Sometimes they're going to have a postgrad research seminar. We do at Nottingham once a week, right? All the postgrads get together and read a paper and talk about it. You could go along to one of those to get an idea of what the research culture is like there. If you're going to be committing to three or four years of study at one department, it's a really good idea to go there first and actually see what PhD life is like in action. OK, guys, so I hope you found that helpful. Thanks so much for listening this far. If you've enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. That really helps me out. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. I'm going to be doing a few more videos on PhD advice coming up in the future. So stick around for those. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you back here soon. <laughs>